controlling this. Uh, I want to start just by saying I got introduced to Dean uh, through Terry Bartow and of course Dennis and Julie Smith. And then my lovely wife Kimberly put uh, yeah. phone calls on all of you to get you here. So yes. we really appreciate uh, all of you coming. You know, tonight is uh, Traces of Humanity is the theme of this. And it's an opportunity to meet this wonderful artist. And what I thought we would do is share a little bit about what the inspiration of this artwork is, how he got to, from where he grew up, to be able as an African-American kid to be able to get on this journey and do it. And I think what you're going to find is his story is very similar to many of your stories. It's uh, unlikely beginnings and, and finishing through through ambition and where there was no one to lead. And, and, and his story touched me and Kimberly so greatly that uh, we immediately felt that it was important for us to be a part of this. So. Um, I thought what we'd do is uh, just have a little conversation and uh, give you a chance just to kind of listen in, and I think it'll give you a window uh, into the artwork. Um, he is perhaps one of best kept secrets in the art field. He has uh, won over 400 awards, and yet he's not a household name. And some of that is purposeful, as you'll hear tonight, as he has stayed principal to the work that he does and what he believes in, uh, as opposed to perhaps more commercial ways that you can make money in this business and through his journeys he'll tell you how he learned about the business of art and there is a business to the fine arts world and uh, how he went on that journey. So um, without further ado let me get into it. Um, you grew up in Quincy, Florida. You grew up with uh, your grandma. You grew up with uh, your aunt and a lot of strong women who really were uh, part of your upbringing no father figures. Tell us a little bit about what growing up in Quincy, Florida, moving to Philadelphia was like? Wow. <laughs> uh, first of all, I was raised by my grandmother for 11 months old. And apparently, uh, at that time, my mother was not a wed mother. And so uh, she actually fled the small town out of embarrassment. And also by the fact that she was in college and they could have kicked her out had they known that she was pregnant. So she gave birth to me and wrote my Uncle Ben, her brother, a letter about me. And I said she'd given birth to a child, and she came home without me. And so my, when she arrived, my grandmother and my grandma Celia and my grandfather at the time, my maternal grandfather, said, so where's the, where's the child? And so they said, wherever he's at, you go back and you get him, and we will raise him, and you will go back to school and finish school. And that's what my mother did. And my grandmother was the one who bought me a paint by number set when I was a boy. I guess if you know much about boys, if you got kids, <laughs> I have twins now, I have a little boy, they're very active. So I was probably very active, so she got me a paint by number set. And this was actually the beginning of my falling in love with art. And so from that paint by number set, uh, that was the inspiration. And from that day forward, I've always loved to draw and paint. Did you get an opportunity to study in class, or did you have uh, an art school, or how is it that you went from a paint by number set to thinking that you had the talent? Well, actually, I think the paint by number set was, uh, if you're familiar with paint by number set, they, they have little dialogues for you, with little numbers to follow the colors by. And because it was so tedious and uninteresting to me that way, I freehand <laughs> the image myself and painted it. And so, uh, uh, as far as studying, well, no, in Quincy, I mean, art was kind of, you know, there was no artist, there was no role models, and it was a small country town. And so, as I got older, art was not something that my mother encouraged, particularly if she had gotten an education, because she had told me up front, and frankly, a black man cannot make a living selling pictures in America. And if you're going to try to pursue this, then maybe you need to go to Europe. And then if you get recognition in Europe, then maybe a miracle would take you on. But we, if you all know the Henry Tanner story, that did not happen for Tanner. Mm -hmm. So why was I thinking it was going to happen for me? So uh, you had the paint by number set. Did you do any research? And you know, we went to study people that were you know, professional artists, Picasso. Or who were the people that you saw when you first started looking at art? You know, actually, when I moved to Philadelphia, uh, I became a little bit more familiar with other artists. Uh, because there was a bookstore that had um, all these different flyers and different things of different artists. And Picasso was one of the first ones that I actually was interested in, quite frankly. Uh, and then, of course, there was Norman Rockwell because he was on the Saturday Evening Post, and so my auntie got the Saturday Evening Post. I became familiar with that. And she also had all, a, lot of, a lot of other magazines, and I became familiar with a, 
a competition you could enter to win a scholarship. It was, it was some kind of famous artist school thing, and they were, it was homeschooling you. They were homeschool you. Well, apparently I thought I won the scholarship. The guy comes over and he's trying to sell my mother this homeschool thing. And she said, that costs way too much money. Nobody's going to pay for that. And she said, well, he could buy his own book. So what I did was, instead of eating lunch, I would take my lunch money, and I would save it for three months or so, and then I would buy a heart. Mm -hmm. So, so these, uh, you know, you were thin, I took it very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good reason why I definitely would have been an art. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, so who were some of the uh, black artists during this time frame when we went to buy these books? Were there any? I didn't know of any uh, black artists. Uh, there, was, there weren't any books that I knew of. I did know that there was a museum in Philadelphia, but my mother was not interested in going to a museum. In fact, uh, there was a, a neighbor who had, had said, well, since your son's interested in art, why don't you take him to the Saturday schools? And so, you know, my mother was just not going to give him for a weekend to take me to art school. And I, I, I had said, well, mom, I could get on the trolley and the, and the bus. And, and then she said, well, because you got to go through a lot of dangerous neighborhoods, to get there, I wasn't allowed to go. So I bought my own books and I just practiced them. So by the time you, you got to high school, Tom Harris was a teacher that was there that uh, uh, guided you a little bit to say that maybe you had a little talent, maybe this could be something that you could do. Yeah, I, uh, at, at that time we were in Philadelphia. And the reason we moved to Philadelphia because my grandmother got ill and she couldn't really take care of us very well. So we all moved with her my cousin Carl and I, well, my grandmother got better and she wanted to move back to Quincy. So we moved back to Quincy. So I had a uh, maybe a three or four year gap there uh, in terms of uh, uh, relationships with people. And there was a teacher there, Tom Harris, who was very much into his students. And there was another gentleman there, uh, by the name of Pete, who was very, very talented. And he was the one that really got us all hyped up about the art shows. And Mr. Harris would take us all these different competitions where you would compete against other high school students and stuff like that. Well, Pete was really the star. The rest of us were kind of like, sort of like the tag-alongs. But the community, <laughs> we were, I, I, I can say that. Uh, and so he would always win all the top prizes in the professional category. Anyway, as things went along, we all got a chance to, to go to art school. But Mr. Harris was taking us around at the time. What I really didn't know, because he never shared a lot of those stories with us, but he was called the nigger lover for taking us three young black kids to all these different art shows. And the only reason why I know that is because there is a documentary. And it will get done. Uh, it's been, it's, we've been working on this thing for a while. But uh, I asked him to, you know, to tell his real experiences with taking us around at those different art shows because we were the only black kids there. We were the only black people there. So you went from high school and you said you all went to college. So yes. Where did you go to college? How did you get to this college? It was by random choice, actually. Um, there was uh, some catalogs, some old brochures at the guidance counselor's office. And uh, uh, Pete had already chosen, I believe, the Cleveland Art Institute. He had a whole bunch of people helping him with his portfolio and all kinds of things. Well, the rest of us, we kind of just sort of thumbing through different magazines. So I had my mom to send to like three or four different schools, and I was waiting to see if I could get accepted. Well, the funny thing about all the whole process is that I missed the idea of getting a scholarship because I didn't know there was such a thing as a portfolio. I sent my work up to a school in a little brown envelope. <laughs> you know, and it's only by the grace of God that I got into art school, quite frankly. Because when I found out what a portfolio was when I got into art school, I was like, how did they think me? That's <laughs> so I was really surprised. So where'd you go? I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio. So when you got there, you're this young emerging artist, and you start looking at the works of the other students and the quality of work. And did you fit in? Were you up to par? What was your sense when you got there? Were you up to the task? Uh, actually, it was a shock because <laughs> uh, you know when you're in a small town like Quincy, and people say, "Well, you're really talented. You're really gifted. You're really this and that." Well, you don't know until you get into a real school and you got something to compare yourself to. Because most people who are uneducated in, in terms of what goes on in terms of art and what it takes to be an artist, they have no idea that a lot of kids have been tutored. They've had private instructions and all kinds of stuff. You get into school and you find out, whoa, uh, maybe I, maybe, uh, yeah, I said maybe I don't belong here because when I got into color classes, they were using different terminologies that I totally didn't understand. There was all these different abstract things to me and I was really actually very, very frustrated. 
it was actually going to drop out after my first semester because I'd lost so much weight. Uh, and I was very thin when I went back home, so my grandmother was very thrilled about it. Uh, but my mother said, well, what are you going to do? I can't take care of you the rest of your life. So I got back on the Greyhound bus. So we get there and you learn these new terminologies like gesture drawing and one of those things. So, so what was those kind of things? Oh man, that was an eye opener for me. You know, Mr. Yeah, my high school art teacher would talk about gesture drawing, but we thought, you know, whatever about the gesture drawing. We were like, if you when you're drawing something, uh, a lot of times when you're when you're not very skilled at what you're doing or don't have the knowledge. You draw a head first, and you put the shoulder on, and you put the arm on, that kind of thing. And what happens is, when you do it that way, a lot of times, the proportions are off. They're not, they're not accurate. Mm -hmm. And so we had a guy there from Yale University, I remember, that drawing. We had new, live new models that would come in and pose for us. And he, wa he walked around very carefully. That's how I got through college, right? <laughs> But anyway, he walked around very carefully, and, and, and so he said, so he, he, he looked at it, and he said, well, I guess he probably figured out a lot of us didn't know much about foundation <laughs> drawing. So he sat down in his chair, and he had the model to move every 30 seconds. 15 seconds, and then he moved to 30 seconds, and then he did what he called gesture drawings. Well, he did what you call the essence of a, of, a, of, a, of a movement with a few lines. And then finally he said, a minute or two minutes. You know, within two or three minutes he had drawn the complete figure. It was miraculous. And I said, I will learn that. <laughs> that's what gesture George made sense. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was, it was, it was an honor. And that led to an interest in watercolor? Uh, yeah, that led to, actually there was a student there that uh, had came in uh, the same year I came in, and I saw for the first time what a portfolio looked like. I was on work, a work study program, and this guy came through. I was super in the hallway. And had this huge black thing with two two handles to it. And I said, "What's that?" He said, "Oh, it's my portfolio. Some of the instructors want to see my portfolio." And I said, "You mind if I take a look at it when you come back through? When you come back through?" He said, "Sure." Well, this kid was just a phenom, a phenom. I'm not kidding. I said, and he opened up his portfolio, and I looked at him, and I said, that's a I said, yeah, I said, whoa, it was, it was an island. He was a student. Mm -hmm. And I ran back to the dorm, and I was staying with another guy named uh, Charles and Jesse. They were both African American, and I ran, and I said, man, I just saw some watercolors, and they already knew the guy. They said, John Pelham? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how did you know? I just saw it. I said, man, you ain't gonna never get that good. And you know what? That next day, uh, when I got my little brown butter, I went and checked out every book I could check out on water. <laughs> and I did my assignments, and I did extra work. And they were over in the corner giggling. And they were laughing at me. You know what? Went home for the summer. I was practicing and practicing. Sophomore year. It almost did happen. Year, you lost 40 pounds. Yeah, I, I did. At this point, was a lot of weight for you to lose. Well, yeah, I I, uh, I was actually afraid to go back because uh, the competition. And then on top of that, when we did the orientation there, they said half of you will not be back. They tell you that you're going to put in as many hours as an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer. I said, I thought. Here's my little country thing. I'm thinking, you just gonna be drawing pictures. <laughs> you gonna be putting that many hours just to be drawing some pictures. Well, you find out there's color classes, there's uh, design classes, there's figure draw. On top of all your art classes, then you have all your academics, and then you have painting, first foundation painting, and believe it or not, color class alone. We only worked in black and white for a complete semester. We were not allowed to use any color. We only had to, we had to use black and white paints, and we had to create atmosphere and, and, and all kinds of stuff for a little bit with just black and white. So uh, I mentioned how you kind of went on a journey learning what the business of art is and how to make an income. You know? And uh, I remember when we talked, I had a chance to see your studio in Tampa, and we spent some hours there. And you mentioned that a friend of yours, Ray Ledbetter, and you 
went around and toured because you said, how are black folks going to make money? Oh, yeah. Business. Well, yeah. And uh, Absolutely. how did that pan out? Well, that paid out to be a shocker, too, because Ray Leatherberry is a, was an artist who was a year or so ahead of me. And we had heard about these artists who had African-American artists who had went to France and Paris. They studied all these different academies and stuff. But your mom had suggested might be a route for you. More route for me. That's absolutely right. So we were all excited. And a guy had opened up a gallery. I think his, I think if my memory served me, I think his name was Koji. He was a photographer. So Ray and I got really excited. And we went over to the show. And, of course, the artists were like two or three times our age. And we were looking at the prices of the artwork. Well, by then, believe it or not, I was selling my work in a little gallery in Panama City for like forty dollars, forty dollars, twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? These artists were selling their work for the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. And we walked out of there and we were shocked. And Ray and I looked at each other and we went, "Whoa, uh, something's wrong." And uh, I started researching artists because I became very, very curious. Uh, there was a museum right next to the school. So as I went through the rooms, I didn't see anything of us, image-wise, and I didn't see any names of any African-American artists. I, I, I had an art history book. There was nothing in that. And I thought, wow, maybe my mom was right. Maybe just say something that <laughs> black folks, my auntie said, you know, black people, they don't spend that kind of money on people. <laughs> you know, that's white people stuff, you know, that's <laughs> And so uh, I said, wow, I started researching them. And then I found out that quite a few of them were really for well-off families. Go for Wall families. Then I found out about Thomas Aikens, how Henry Tanner studied under him, the African American artist Tim Tanner. And I read his story. And then as I as I began to emerge on the scene, I ran into all the artists who were telling me about the difficulties of selling their work and making a living and all these different things. And I thought, wow, uh, maybe this is maybe I better rethink some of this. So you put all this effort into it, fell in love with watercolor art went out and realized that the route going to Europe really wasn't going to be Absolutely. A, a successful route in terms because if they didn't do it successfully, there was no reason to believe that you could. So you told me you came up with this new plan, which was entering in competitions in a way that maybe you thought, because you didn't have any money, that you might be able to make a living. So what, what was your plan after this? Well, you know, it's really funny. There was a guy named Walter King who was a, he was a student. He was a white fellow. He was poor, just like I was. He was just Caucasian, but I, we, I was talking about how I wanted to be a fine artist. I said, you know, dude, that's, you know, fine art is hard. I said, yeah, but that's really what I really, really want to do. And I said, well, Walter, here's, here's the plan. So I've been researching all these artists. I said, you ever heard of National Academy, American Water Collections, all these different art organizations out of New York? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter competition. And that's going to be my platform to the art world. Because I don't have any money, I don't have any real political connections. And from what I understand, people are already connected to the art world. And uh, that's how I got my foot in. And I also wanted to do it too, because as I began to emerge on the scene in terms of getting my work represented, I found out that very few mainstream galleries had art of color in their galleries. And I thought, well, and then a lot of my friends who were becoming known and stuff, uh, in illustration said that that was the that was the that was the way to go, uh, not fine art. That it was done away from. So the creme de la creme of that is the American Watercolor Society and um, the National Academy. The National Academy and most people who try to enter that don't do very well. And so when did you get your first opportunity to apply? How long did it take? You know, I had a watercolor instructor who thought I was pretty good. He said, you know, in fact, he was the one who actually introduced me to the American Watercolor Society. His name was Leland McClellan. And he said, have you ever heard of it? I said, no. I said, I've been doing some research. And I, said, uh, I said, but I'm not really familiar with the process. So he said, you know, I enter it every year. And he said, I think you should give it a shot. I think you might have a chance. So I entered it my senior year in college, and I got in. And I was just thrilled. I couldn't wait to come back and tell Mr. McClellan. I said, Mr. McClellan, I got a miracle walk. So he said, shut up. You can't do what? You can't. I said, yeah, this is what I did. He said, I you got in your first try. I've been trying 20 years now. <laughs> and then it, it, it spread through the school like wildfire, and I got in, and the instructor wanted to see the painting and all kinds of stuff. And, and actually, I had won an award that year in the in the Society of Illustrated Student Exhibition. And the school, for the first time, flew all the student up who had won, won an award that year. And it was the first time I ever been on a plane. And one of the girls who won one of the awards, too, was from New York. So she said, we got to go over to the National Academy and see Dean's painting. So 
you know, I went up to see my wife and I was like 20, 21 years old. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you mentioned about Pete Henson and he was sort of the star right. in your neighborhood growing up and he went to Cleveland Art School and he had tremendous success early on. Very much. How did his career pan out and what influences did you gain from sort of watching him as a contemporary? Well, part of the part of what I realized from Pete was that <clears throat> when we were younger, Pete would always win all the prize. And usually the prize would came with a little bit of money. And my grandmother would always say, Well, did you win anything? I said, Well, I got a rhythm. She said, What Pete win? <laughs> so Pete went off. Uh, she said, she said well, he always win. I said, Yeah, he's really good, girl. And she said, He's pretty. I said, Yeah, he's just really good, girl. And he, he's really good. And so uh, what I recognized from that was that a lot of the Caucasian people in the community were, was buying his work. In fact, he has some paintings hanging up in the Quincy uh, Courthouse right now that was commissioned. They specially created a job for him to create these paintings. And, yes, okay. and they still have those hanging there. And so, uh, but what I recognized was, if I'm going to enter these shows, I got to win. I have to win. Because I recognized when he was winning the best show in the, during his teenage years and stuff, they just they wanted a winner. I said, people like women. I can't be second. I can't be third. I gotta be first. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't arrogance. It's just that I recognize that people respond to excellence in the best, and that's what I went for. And so Pete was actually an education for me, watching how people gravitate to him at a young age and buying his work. And so. He became very successful very quickly, and I think that he got to the Cleveland Art Institute, and I think he might have got overwhelmed too. He had success very early, and then he moved back to Quincy, which I thought was not a good idea for art in those days. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> well, anyway, things just did not work out. And he just, you know, drug, uh, a lot of stuff got, got thrown into the, to the pie. And I actually, we, we, everybody tried to help him. I mean, I can't tell you how many people tried to help him. Uh, and he's very gifted, but just, we don't know why, we don't know whether it was success too early, was it a lot of pressure, but he did get a job right away with the, with the Phipps family. The Phipps family really liked him, they hired him at WCTV. <coughs> he was there for a good amount of time, and I tried to get him to enter the American Law Society and different things. He even tried the gallery in Panama City for a while. That didn't quite work out either. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's one of those kind of things where you don't know. I, what I recognize too from that, Every decision that you make, no matter how small you think it is, it, it can be a very significant part of the puzzle. Uh, you know, it's kind of like you could you could have a, a wonderful thing going, but if you don't put that one stone in there that supports all that, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an education for you, a lesson in humility, watching a contemporary and seeing what success early can. Be. And I think too, I wasn't I wasn't so much. I didn't have people expecting anything of me, you see, but he had a whole community looking at him and who was supporting him and doing a lot of things for him. So I didn't have the pressure that he had. Uh, the pressure that I had was just upon myself that here was a grandmother who had taken me in with a fourth grade education, who was always drilling to get a good education, that's your way out. And when I, when, I, when I was in art school and I started feeling sorry for myself, I lost all this weight, I said, you know what? You know, my grandmother didn't even have an opportunity. At least I got, I got a shot. So the plan was working. At least you could see a level playing field and a way for you to move forward. Yeah, too. So you graduate from college and you go get your first job at Hallmark. At Hallmark. And how does that work? Out? That you in the greeting card section doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. I, you know, quite frankly, you know, uh, Hallmark was another again another, another learning tool. I ran into a lot of wonderful artists. Uh, uh, a few who were African Americans who were employed there. But what I did learn, I learned the politics of the corporate world, which I was totally out of touch with. Uh, they really liked me, they thought I was very gifted, and I do know uh, I got to, to work in what they call S&I. Well, because they asked me what department I wanted to work in. Well, and I said, well, S&I, I mean, that's nice. And they said, well, I said, well, it seems more interesting. And apparently they don't usually hire artists right into that. You have to work your way up. That's not a style of Yeah. Yeah, you have to work up to that. Well, they hired me right into there. 
And uh, uh, anyway, uh, when I went in the next day, there was all these artists who were coming up to me. There were some more African American, quite a few from down in Green Card. And I was talking about art shows, a different kind of thing. They said, you know, how much does it like you talk about that kind of stuff? And I said, well, they don't care. I've already talked to the vice president and all this. Come to find out they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was entering these different shows. And one of the shows that I entered was the T.H. Saunders International Arts and Water Club. And one of the reasons why, because it was in London. The top prize was $2,000. Well, I had to work all month to bring home almost $1,000 for home. Wow, to get the win, it would just be neat to hang to say you hung something in Europe. Hey, hey. Well, I got accepted and I won the top award, which is $2,000 prize. Well, at the time, I only had $300 in my account. It cost me 100 bucks to get a frame, and then another 100 bucks. To ship it over there. <laughs> so that, that left you me were rolling the dice with 100 left. So yeah, I was like, you know, this might not be a good idea this year. <laughs> 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 that's a good segue to taking risks. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, so so you rolled the dice and um, and you won the first prize, and, and that really was what your goal was was about winning and winning in these competitions, as we said, to um, to level the playing field. How did the winning at Hallmark go over? With? Did you? Well, it wasn't well received. Well, that year I had been at over 20 shows, national shows. And within a four month span, I had won about $6,000 in different shows mm -hmm. uh, that I had entered. Uh, and so there was an article in a, in a publication there, the Artist Coalition. Do you remember all that? Anyway, Artist Coalition. And they had my paying on the front cover that I had won. And when I walked into work, I saw it on the secretary's desk. I said, oh, no, it's going to be some crap today. <laughs> and so there was. They didn't really like it. They wanted me to stop. And I said, look, you know, uh, this is something you said I could do. Now suddenly I can't do it. And so I didn't realize the guy that was over my department actually at one time wanted to be a painter and had studied under the famous painter Thomas Hart Pitt and had sold out to Homer. He was the one who was saying, he said, you know, you need to make up your mind whether you want to be here or whether you want to be out there. And I said, no, I don't. I said, I give you what you want on your time. I said, what I do in my own free time, according to this department, I can do whatever I want as long as not doing something for the competitor. You didn't know I didn't know the corporate department. <laughs> <laughs> so you lost your job at Hallmark. I did after, uh, you know, what was really funny though, after three months interview, uh, Mr. Parker called me and wanted to know if I was going to make a career out of it. And I said, I don't really know yet. And he said, well, why so? I said, well, I said, well, you know, Ms. Parker, I've only been here about three months. And I said, I said, you really want my honest opinion? He said, yeah, I want your honest opinion about the job and how you feel about it. <laughs> I said, well, quite frankly, Mr. Parker, I said, uh, I don't see any African Americans in any positions of authority at home. I said, so you're asking me if I'm going to make a career out of something where I see None of us in the creative division. I said I can't speak for the rest of the department, but there's nobody in position of power, authority, or, or managers hardly or anything. I said, sorry, now you're asking me if I'm going to make a career out of it. I don't know. Should Hallmark change? And I see other African Americans moving up the ladder. And I see some changes, perhaps. But the way I see it right now, Ms. Parker, I think not. So you're on your own, and you've decided you're going to have to rough it because you're principled to what you believe in. So who are the artists that you start to see now that, that inspire you and the work that we see here tonight? Uh, what, what are the influences that, that generate? Oh, you know, my influence is, you know, what people have to, to realize with my work is that it was heavily, it's, it's what you call, what most would say, a more Euro-centric or European influence. And uh, my thing is, like, this. I look at I look at art as information, and I don't care who's doing it, what culture, because all great artists. When you look at Picasso and all these great artists, or Matisse, or any of them, or Jacob Lawrence, any of these great Henry Tan, these great artists, uh, they didn't get so caught up into race. It was the culture of the time that was caught up into race. These men were on a higher intellectual level about learning, about humanity, and presenting something that was real to the human form, to the human emotion. But at, the, at, at certain times in our history, race and all these kind of ignorant things came into play to suppress us from becoming a better and bigger, greater nation. Uh, we could be a greater nation with all this nonsense. So I looked at things like 
I didn't care who it was from, who, what, I looked at Rembrandt, Picasso, Matisse, Renoir, Henry Tanner, uh, Jacob Lawrence, but you name it, I think they, I'm going to look and I'm going to try to learn from it. Because, I mean, that's how you grow as a painter, that's how you grow as an artist. People say Andrew Wyeth and people like that. Andrew Wyeth. Like your artwork, who's a white painter. Yes. I've been painted black subjects. Yes. But in the black community, people said your work wasn't black enough. Well, yeah, I had somebody say, well, what are you going to do some black art? And I was like, well, I'm black. I'm doing art. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so, I said, so, uh, I said, you know, I said, I don't really get the whole black art thing. Uh, you know, I kind of understand there's a certain kind of style of art that may be associated with a more, uh, what, what you call a more derivative of the continent of Africa. And we know Africa is a big place. Uh, but the one thing that I learned about that was when I looked at Picasso, and like I said, all great artists, they pull from any place they want to pull from. When you look at somebody like a Van Gogh, you go back and you study the Japanese woodblock cuts. There's your Van Gogh. He just used oil paint. But suddenly there was this new movement, the Impressionist movement. No new movement. I mean, Rembrandt was painting very Impressionistic before the Impressionists came out. Some of his lateral portraits were very, very Impressionistic in terms of his brushwork and handling of serpents and textures. Very, very Impressionistic, just more Carlos Struo, more light and dark. But as far as the activity in terms of the brushwork and the energy, all Impressionists. I'm going to shake my head and pretend I understood you. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> trying to keep this on my end. <laughs> we just <laughs> tread it into the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> that goes a little, and I have a card for that. So you're out there and you're, and you're selling your work, and uh, you kind of find out it's not so easy, and you go on a journey out in the panhandle, which may not be the best place for five artists to sell work. But you go to a dozen or so galleries and tell us about that journey when you're. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, you know what? My mother had actually encouraged me to enter a show that was in Panama City. And she saw it in the local newspaper. She said, I think she entered a show. And I looked and said, well, That's got like 20, 30 gallons. I probably didn't get it. She said, well, baby, just try it. So I entered it and I won a prize. It was like a $100 savings bond. So I decided I was going to go down and pick it up. So we went down to the Marine Exhibit Center. And I walked in and said, I'm being mental. And of course, they recognized my name, and she said, You're black. <laughs> and I was like, Yeah. yeah. And, she, and, 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 and here's how she said it. She said, Oh, no, no, young man. Don't get me wrong. She said, I just, We're just so excited. You were the first black artist to ever enter our show. We were just so excited to have you. And they, they treated me so nicely. In fact, there was a lady by the name of Joanne Dickerson. But I was very talented, and she was going to find me a gallery. That's when she took me up and down the pan out. Nobody wanted my work. So finally, she just finally like, hey, you know, they don't want to work because you're black. They're pretty going to run off the clientele. And she just went on. So, so finally, we stopped at this one place. And I said, look, that's not taking work. I just want to look at the art. And we went in at Spelman's Gallery. And I was looking at the work. And there was a young guy who was sort of hippie with a ponytail. He said, are you an artist or something? Yeah. He said, I could tell. Where are you looking at the artwork? He said, do you have any work here? I looked at Joe in. Like, everybody else was saying no. This guy's asking to see it. I was like, wow. I ran out and got the work. And he says, uh, these are great. He said, I'll buy. I'll buy five of them right now. So, mm -hmm. And I'll uh, put the rest on consignment, whatever you're willing to leave. And I'll send you a check. And that was my first gallery. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's times where you get to a point in your career, there's a bump in the road. And you yeah, you want to. 40 pounds, you almost gave up. You're almost out of artwork. You're almost down to your last hundred dollars, and you enter the prize in London. Here you're in the Panhandle, broke, yeah. and you sell a piece of work. So, it's, but it's been it's it's very interesting. There has been a lot of pivotal points like that because when I got fired from Hallmark, uh, my grandmother passed not too much longer after that, uh, and so I went up in a little bit of apartment, and actually quite. Frankly, I was very suicidal with not wanting to live. And depressed, I didn't have any money, I was broke, I was in there. I, and then my mom, I could hear my mom's words. And I told you this art. 
And so I laid down on my little mattress of box spray that time, felt sorry for myself, and crying and not wanting to go out. In fact, they called me to mountain me and I had a beard, and I had hair, I wouldn't comb and all kinds of stuff. And uh, the soft voice said, baby, did I tell you nobody's going to give me anything this morning, you got to work. Yeah, you had a spiritual connection. You know, the, the art gallery here put a quote, and I just pulled it off the wall. I put it back, but I wanted to read it. <laughs> and it says, I'm drawn to the humane, but there is something more there, which I would describe as spiritual. I do believe in God. I do believe when you create that something else to take over. I've said this. Ask yourself, what is the intention for bringing this work of art into existence? If that intention is pure, to say something to humanity or to stir something in people, then you are tapping into another source beyond your control. If you are creating for self-indulgence or for gain, something will be lost, and I'm not sure it can be regained. That's, that's, that I think that, you know, I think that's probably a lot of wisdom I got, probably from my grandmother. You know, my grandmother and the people I grew up with didn't have a lot of material wealth. My aunt Dolly, she'd never learned how to read or write. But there was a dignity and an honor to how they handled things. And I watched that in a certain honor. And, and I've also, and I've watched other people's careers throughout, you know, whether it's music or art or anything. And a lot of times, when you're not connected spiritually to a higher sense of why you're doing something, you're going to crash and burn. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how much money you make. It's not going to make you happy. It's not going to fill your soul. And you're going to do all kinds of crazy stuff looking to fill that hole. And that hole doesn't have anything to do with money. I mean, we, I recognize that I live in a capitalist society and I have to make money. I understand that. And I even understand even more so I have a family. But I think that if you're trying to create something to move people to a higher place, to either get along with one another, to stop wars or famine or whatever it is that is crippling our way of life as, as, a, as a world, as a people. And I think that's a different kind of sensibility that you bring. And I think that people will respond to it. Sometimes it's not always within the artist's lifetime. Sometimes it takes people a while to catch up. Because sometimes there are certain things that make people uncomfortable. And art can do that to some people. It can make them very uncomfortable. Uh, Rowena made people uncomfortable, uh, but she was such a powerhouse in terms of a strength and an emotion in that painting that I think that people just had to stop. And there are things that mesmerize the soul to the point that you just have to stop and, and question how you live in your own life. Art does that. Great art does that. You, you talked about Rowena. And you painted this black woman, uh, ordinary woman, for an exhibit at the Hubbard Exhibit. And how did you choose to paint Rowena? And what was the significance of that work? It was actually, um, it was a way of celebrating my grandmother who had passed, who I could not get to actually model for me. So a friend had introduced her to me, and at the time, yeah, she was just, you know, very much that grounded that she was solid. And I said, wow, she is something. And I didn't pay her for a few years or so. And then I got invited to this show. And I didn't realize I was the only African American out there, the youngest artist invited to this show, where I was competing for a quarter of a million dollars. And this was in 1990. I was the only artist of color invited. I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And she was the first person to talk to my head. And I said, I called her up and I said, Is that about this day? I said, uh, Think about, I don't want to have you model for me. And she says, yeah, she says, no, baby, you know, you know. I said, she said, but I do need an air conditioner. I said, <laughs> she said, she said, well, she said, uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what, Miss Highball, I'll come and pick you up, and I'll buy your air conditioner. I said, uh, I'll buy your air conditioner. This friend of mine had brought her over, and she was wanting to get this air conditioner. And I said, look, I said, uh, I'll get the air conditioner. She said, no, baby, I can't let you spend that kind of money. I said, yeah, you can. And I took her out and I got her the air conditioner and I put it in for her. Little, little, little. And she had that thing, I'm telling you, blasting. It had a little freezing. She said, oh, it feels so good. I said, how about? So I said, will you pose it? So she posed for me and everything. And I was working on the pace on She said, when am I going to see this thing? I said, Ms. Well, how about? 
I got to have you come back over. I got to adjust the colors a little bit more. And she was sitting on the couch. I was trying to adjust the colors. So I finally, she, I showed it to her. She looked at it. And she said, baby, like that. You go to water whole black. You don't want something like that. You don't want a whole black. You know, it just broke up. Yeah. When I sent it down to the Hubbard show, it was even, it got more interesting. Because uh, at the opening, there was about, oh, about, I don't know, about a good eight, nine hundred people there, maybe. Uh, and people walk by the painting, and it's beautiful, but I don't know where I put her at. Because they were in the Western art. And so, the Rowena, you know, was an African American figure, but apparently <coughs> it had got a lot of attention, but nobody wanted it. And I didn't realize at the time that it was going to be a finalist. But my mother was at the show, and there was another artist that had did a painting of an African American. And she didn't like it. And she said, I think that just looks very foolish. Why do you always got to like a, make us look like that? And I said, well, we're not here. <laughs> anyway, uh, that painting sold her, but we didn't sell. Well, my mom was just livid. She was, I said, well, we can talk about this later when we get to it. Hotel. So anyway, I don't know what happened, whether Mr. Hubbard found out or not, but he came over, he sat next to us because we did a day reception at his home. And uh, he sat, me, sat on my side, he said, uh, you can consider a way to sell because my wife really loves that painting. You can consider it so. He said, I tell you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what got more interesting, the next day they were going to announce who the quarter of a million dollar winner was. I was in the top six. I didn't win, but I got the biggest applause. I got a bigger applause than the artists who actually had won all the money. And Joe Dale ran over to me and she said, Ms. Hubbard said, ooh, won't that make news? And it did. <laughs> <laughs> in the newspaper actually said, yeah. the writer said, the guy that should have won, the picture that everybody in the room thought was the most was Rowena. But you sold Rowena for $40,000. 25, 25. 25. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, what was really fascinating about that, that was standing with Mrs. Hubbard, and somebody else came along and offered her 40. You were right in that sense. And, wrote, and, and so, Joe Dale was so funny, she, she just took a liking to me. She said, hey, for seven. Hey, for seven. You had a chance to buy it. Hey, for seven. And, and, and so, uh, anyway, she said, you know, Dee, and I still see. Uh, John Dale. In fact, with the recession hit, John Dale called trying to buy a penny for me. She called a gallon. I thought, that's interesting. John Dale got my number and everything. He could just call me. I have a kind of relationship with him. And so, come to find out, I looked up. She went into this gallery, bought like a couple of paintings. Somebody saw her buying. They bought a painting. They said, you know, I got a gallery. And, oh, oh, because, of, because of that. Because the recession had hit. And so I think that she was, again, trying to help me. And uh, she's always been that, she's just the sweet of a person. And, and in fact, when this documentary got, was going to get made, I said, I said, John Dale, I said, this guy's from New York, you're going to do a documentary. I said, uh, she said, New York. New York. I said, yeah, yeah you're Western people. They're all New York people. Anyway, uh, I said, well, I'm not asking for any money. What I need is an interview. And she did grant us an interview, which she doesn't really do. She's very extremely private. And I, re I respect her a great, a great so the documentary, Making of a Master, uh, product is the fact that you've won over 400 awards. You've written two books. Who did you do the books with? Oh, well, I pretty much, well, I had a friend who helped me with the first one, a and &A, But I pretty much, you know, laid it out, designed it. And in fact, I had a publisher I was working with at that time. And I said, you got to understand, this book has been done, this is about 15 years ago. And when I first started talking about doing a book, uh, a lot of you guys are like, no, you know, artists don't do their own books. It's not something you do. That, that was frowned upon. And I said, well, I kept, I kept looking, going into bookstores. I see four or five books of Picasso, all these different artists. Well, you see nobody. I ain't even see Jacob Lawrence or Tanner, nobody. I said, I'm doing, do my own book. So I told the guy, I said, you know what, you don't want to do my book. He said, well, we do. Who's going to be the market? Who's going to want to buy it? And he got into all that, the marketing aspect. And I said, you know, I'm doing my own book. And so when I published it, and I sent it to the publisher. He said, who published your book? I said, you talking to him. He said, is this the book you were talking about doing? I said, well, yeah. He said, so who designed it for you? Who, who did the writing on that? I said, you talking to him. 
He said, you mean to tell me this is the book you were talking about? I said, yeah, I pre-sold it to my collector base. And I brought in almost half of the money before I went to press. So I pre-sold it to people who are collecting my work. And I offered them a drawing of the book to help offset the cost of it. Because at that time, the book would cost you easy cost the same degree. Did you do a book with Maya Angelou too? Yes, I did. Uh, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's very interesting because I had met Maya some years ago because they, they had did a small documentary uh, with Billy Dee Williams, who was hosting the program, along with another artist by the name Thomas Black. She was very well known to them. It's a lot of historical scares. And so they were only going to do Tom and I. Well, they couldn't get it on PBS. PBS, even with our credentials and what we've done, PBS wasn't interested. But when Billy D said he would host it, suddenly we had a movie star. PBS picked it up. And so, uh, but part of the deal was Billy had to have a section, so we each got 20 minutes instead. And so uh, it premiered in New York. In fact, it, it played so much, believe it or not, you're not going to kid you. I got recognized in the Metropolitan Museum of Art by a kid working at the counter. I said, Power the Press. Here's why we're not known. Here's why nobody, this is why we in the house all day. We ain't got nobody publishing our book. We ain't got nobody making no documentaries about us. We ain't got no critics coming around talking about our art. We don't own the magazines, all the art magazines and publications I was in was mainstream. A lot of black people read those magazines. So I wasn't becoming known there. I was becoming more known in mainstream. I was not being becoming known in, 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 in the black community. And it wasn't from a lack of not reaching out. I wrote Ebony, I wrote Essence, I wrote any black woman. They just weren't interested. They just weren't they weren't ever interested. Not interested. So we'll wrap it with Eric, twin boys, yep. living here in Tampa and traveling. So what's the next story that you mentioned where we go from here? Oh, I'm enjoying my life right now. Uh, my kids, you know what? I'm hoping uh, to continue to push the envelope in terms of of trying to educate people more about the arts and the purpose of art and how it influences our lives economically, socially, spiritually, because I think that's very, very important and I want to grow my kids up that way. And I want them to be sensitive to, to the world around them. I don't want them to become so self-absorbed that they're not sensitive to their environment, what goes on in it, because we all live in this world. Believe it or not, when you think one thing isn't affecting you, believe me, it is affecting because it's just not the way the world operates. I mean, the sun revolves, I mean, we revolve around the sun. So everything in the universe, that's why I think there's a God, whether you believe in there's a God or not, the universe is too orderly. And certain, uh, it's, just too, it's just too calculated uh, how if the, if the earth moved a little too close to the sun, we could totally, it's, it's just too, it's, this is just not, this is an artist <laughs> that created the universe. And however we relate to it, and we, and I think in some ways, in our own primitive way, we try to still relate to it. But the one thing that we haven't learned yet, and I still say this, we have not learned to truly love. Just haven't. And it's, it's, it, that sounds so simple, but we have not. Man is still a very selfish creature because I myself battle with my own selfish things. But you have to move to a higher place if you're really going to enjoy life. You cannot enjoy life if it's all about you. And I do not want my kids to think that the world revolves around you. You are just here for a moment and a brief moment in time. Enjoy it. Try to live it right. Try to help people if you can. Try to just live right. It makes the world so much simpler. You know how much energy it takes to do bad stuff? It takes a lot of energy and it drains you. But when you're doing something wonderful, you don't have all the baggage. Creativity is free. And I think when the artist stays free and he's true to his emotions and what he sees, and he wants to reflect back to you what you're doing to one another or how you, I think that's an important development for us to move beyond this primitive stage of blowing each other up. We are doing some crazy stuff. We have all this technology, but we still are thinking so primitive in terms of how we interact with you. And that's why you have all the chaos all the time. It's all about power. 
me, me would become me society. And if, if I could do anything in my heart, I would push us away from that as much as I can in my short spare time. Well, what was wonderful was this evening with you, and I think we all want to love you. Thank you.